Investors Chronicle. Welcome to the Investors Chronicle interview podcast. I'm Dan Jones. And I'm pleased to say today we're joined by Katie Potts, manager of the Herald Investment Trust. Katie established Herald Investment Management 30 years ago in 1993 and has managed the tech focused trusts since its launch in February 1994. She began her career at Bearings Investment Management and prior to founding Herald was a top rated city analyst of electronics companies in the 80s and 90s. Katie, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. So we'll begin with the straightforward one, uh, or maybe not so straightforward, we'll see. You've obviously been investing in the sector for uh, several decades now, a long time. How do you value technology stocks? What metrics are most important to you looking at companies and, and how, if at all, has that changed over the years? Clearly, technology is a growth sector and we focus on growth companies. It's more complicated trying to work out what the the future profits might be and we've uh, because of the smaller company focus of the trust uh, we, we focus on companies at time of investment at any rate on market capitalizations below three billion but our, our median market cap is is uh, a lot lower than that um, in fact it was 167 million um, at the end of June and we are there's a life cycle to how we invest. We tend to invest um, when the companies are small and let our bigger um, successful companies run. So the top 20 holdings we've got, we've owned for 12 to 13 years. Um, but at the early stage, we are often buy when it's loss making. And you say, how do you value a company when it's loss making? And I think we have to look at what are the gross margins of the business What's the growth rate? How much do they have to grow the cost base <laughs> to grow the revenues? Um, but I think at the back of my mind is a, a valuation sense check. Even if it's loss making, you've got to think, what has this company got to do to be on a P of 10? <laughs> how much has, have the revenues got to grow? And how many years will it take to get the market cap back in profits? And uh, clearly, there are a lot of variables, and so it, it's it, it's not it can't be a precise uh, measure. But it's why software companies, which have 100%, nearly 100% gross margins on a marginal sale, you can expect there to be a kicker to the bottom line more than a manufacturing company, whether they have got to buy components and products and use machines and the gross margin. It is a lot lower. But historically, we've always run with about 17% of the portfolio in early stage loss making companies. And then we own them, them going forwards. In fact, we've only got 12% in loss making companies at the moment. And that's because we were aware there was a bit of a bubble a couple of years ago. Not so much in the stock market, but there was a bit of a bubble in venture capital and PE and um, and a degree of fashion for the sector in public markets and took the view that with interest rates rising, uh, money becoming more expensive, you know, the P of cash is, is more like 20 times now as it was over 100 times not very long ago. So that's understandable reason why valuation should be lower because the risk-free return is is that there is at least a return, even if it's not a return in real terms. And we're expecting there to be a lot of people who are having to raise money. And that is when you move into a buyer's market territory, which we're beginning to see already. I think we've been approached by 70 companies this year for fundraisings of primary capital. And that's when there are interesting valuations. I struggle with some US valuations because you sometimes or quite often see companies with a billion of retained losses. And you think, heck, you know, when are they going to get a billion back in profits? And the, there's some of the valuations there. There's a degree to which you, you can't see the market cap coming back in profits on a reasonable time frame. And as far as I'm concerned, that you're then investing on the greater fool theory 
that somebody will pay even more for it than you will. And there's an element where you have to play the market and realize what's fashionable and that somebody's going to get excited by this. And it's a common mistake people make in investing, particularly with IPOs, is people dress it up to say there's 40% growth and tempt you to think that it's 40% growth ad infinitum. And often they're clever at dressing it up so that they put lots of sales marketing in just before an IPO and uh, get the growth. But actually, um, they're penetrating the market quicker than you might think. So that's another factor. You think, well, how big is the potential market? How how long can they go on growing at 40%? And there are times when it's easy to, to measure, like, say, accounting software. It's easy to know every firm needs accounting software. <laughs> you, you know how big the market is. You know how many SMEs there are. You know how many mid-cap companies there are. You know how many large companies. It, it's more complicated with a market like AI. It's very when the target hard. market is impossible to discern, perhaps. Exactly. Um, but I think the, the, the evidence, I, I'm sure some people have already played with chat GPT. You can see how powerful it is. But at the end of the day, to make a market, you really need uh, a market that people will pay for. How big will that be? And going back to the US, UK, uh, there have been the US has been fantastic at giving lots of capital to companies, but almost too much, which means that you struggle to to get the the metrics that I like to work. On the other hand, there's greater support for tech companies in America than there is in the UK because they've had a handful of successes that have done really well. You know, the the famous Fangs <laughs> um, have done so well. Everyone's looking for the next one. And you've got to think, well, actually, can this company really grow like that? Because is the addressable market that big? In the UK, it's much lower risk because people are nothing like as optimistic. On the other hand, equally, people aren't given the money to grow and become market leaders in the same way. So on the on the subject of US v UK, then, you know, this oh. has obviously been a big focus this year, not just in tech, but in, in you know, uh, investment markets, mm -hmm. equity markets in general. Mm -hmm. It sounds like, you know, there are, from your point of view, there are pluses and, and minuses to both sides of the equation. Uh, do you think in the UK there are, there are structural reasons other than, you know, simply the amount of money people are prepared to give to tech stocks? Are there structural reasons for the amount of money people are prepared to give relative to the US? I mean, the real problem in the UK is I think people are increasingly aware, but we've been rabbiting on about it for a long time. Mm. Partly because when I raised the fund, I raised uh, 65 million in 1994 and 30 million two years later and haven't raised any money since. We bought back over 300 million pounds of the stock and the, the assets are over 1.2 billion now. So I, I think it's 22 times return since inception. Um, but then I raised the money from insurance companies and pension funds and I've, I watched the register morph over time um, as the pension funds and insurance companies sold out because they have the defined benefit. Companies have left the pension market. And um, we've our share has been replaced more by wealth managers and there's still a small number of pension funds left. But that has been re reflected in the registers of the companies we invest in in the UK as well. And that pension funds have withdrawn, insurance companies have withdrawn. And particularly at the smaller end, it's rather left funds and individuals being being the investors. So there has been a shortage of capital. And it does mean that valuation has been higher in the States. So they have seen UK assets as cheap and, and bought them. And I've actually uh, done the exercise of seeing how many takeovers we've had in the UK. Um, since 20 including 2015 to, to the current we've had 57 takeovers and that's just in small cap tech uh, so it's a little, quite a lot of companies and that's been 273 million in value of, of takeovers i think one of the second problems that's emerged i think exaggerated by by mifid is there's been a bifurcation between small cap brokers and large cap brokers 
in days gone by, the big houses did have a small cap team and did float companies. Um, but now there is an inefficiency that as the small companies grow, their shareholder base doesn't naturally move to, to large cap shareholders because they don't deal with the small cap brokers. So companies can get stuck uh, and be an attractive value to either a PE house or, or, or a US owner. Do you uh, think this situation will improve on a number of fronts, I suppose, firstly, in terms of you know, the efforts being made to, to try and change this, mm. uh, you know, this landscape of investment? Secondly, in terms of you know, the valuation gap between the UK and the US, as you mm. say, that can sometimes close uh, via takeovers. Mm. But in both those mm. things, are you, are you optimistic, both for a change in the landscape well. but also the prospect of stocks rising? Well, one good thing is, whereas I've gone on about the issue for a decade or more, I think there's now a much wider realisation there's an issue. And once people recognise there is a problem, that's a significant part of the way towards addressing it. Mm. Um, but there is, of course, the problem that because we're borrowing so much money as a country, there's competition for people to buy, buy gilts in the UK, treasuries in the US, euro bonds in Europe. You know, but everywhere governments have got big fiscal deficit and where's the money coming from so that is the cloud over the market not over tech but over the whole market um there is competition for capital now with with bonds uh, to a greater extent um than ever but another reason why it, it should improve is that we're lucky enough to meet management teams with our smaller company global focus although we have 40 percent in the uk we do have 25 percent in the states and uh, smaller slugs in Asia and America. And what I'm acutely aware of and have been frustrated for uh, the last nine months, I think, when the Bank of England were being so negative about the UK economy, I scratched my head and thought, go around the world, everybody's worried about their headache and everybody thinks their headache's the worst. And I think just think the British are better at shouting about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> and... Yeah. Uh, I'm not in the least surprised. I think the GDP figures in the UK have been slightly better than expected. And that's what it feels like at the bottom. We d it doesn't feel like a recession when you're talking to companies. There's been a bit of softness in advertising. And I think the consumer is affected by rising interest rates and inflation. Um, but on the whole, U UK um, feels pretty stable um, compared to... Uh, to other countries and I think partly because we've been so public about addressing the problems we've undoubtedly got in terms of fiscal deficits and interest rate rises and so on but I think because we've been so public about it people have been net sellers of UK equities and there have been record outflows almost every month of UK equities in, from funds and if there are more sellers than buyers it means share prices go down and that has been reflected in our first half performance, where overall we were sort of all but flat in, in NAV uh, per share. But within that, uh, we lost money uh, quite significantly in the UK. The UK returned minus 11.5%. And in contrast, our US portfolio was up 21%. But that's sort of easy to spot. What is um, hidden behind that is if you look at the average PE of those stocks, the average P in the UK has declined 8%. So that's just a simple way of saying UK stocks are cheaper than they were at the start of the year. <laughs> and interestingly, we've done the analysis on our own portfolio. And at the end of 2020, the P of the UK was 26 times. and. Uh, it's now 15 times. So I'm glad to say that our return is hasn't shrunk nearly as much as the PE has. So things are looking a lot a lot cheaper than they were. Mm. But it does it is in stark contrast to the overseas markets where every overseas market is more expensive than it was at the start of the year. In particular, our North American portfolios, the PE has gone up by 33.8 percent. So that's a staggering difference that the UK is derated while the US has 
has got more expensive. And equally, Asia's 23% more expensive and Europe's 9% more expensive. But I think a lot of it's the psychology of the British being aware of our problems and being negative about it. Mm. Yes, I think that's fair. uh, And it's the the UK investor that's been the the seller of... uh, In in the small cap world, overseas investors are, uh, are largely irrelevant. So from your perspective then, do you are you now topping up more on the UK? Are you trying to uh, fight this momentum? Do you think this momentum might shift? Interestingly, I've done a cash flow exercise and since 2017, we have taken money out of the UK in every six month period until the first half of this year. Overall, we've taken 210 million out of the UK from the 1st of January 2017. And that's partly because of takeovers and partly because I was sort of nervous about the illiquidity of the market and and the cash flows. Um, It doesn't actually mean that UK companies have, have underperformed at a trading level because in the tech world, it's a global sector and they've got the same markets everywhere. If anything, UK companies have benefited from Sterling's been weak over that period of time. And so their overseas earnings have, have enhanced in Sterling terms. Um, and it affects a trading company more than just a share price. You, when Sterling weakens, it's instant gratification for overseas holdings. But it's often delayed gratification for UK holdings because it takes time for profits to come through. At, at a higher level. Does it surprise you that I say everybody thinks their own headaches the worst? No, um, that seems like a very natural uh, response. And I think there uh, is a certain mm. Britishness to it as well. You're right. Uh, uh, you know, we have had a number of things go wrong, but isn't there maybe yes. the national character to emphasize yeah. those? We all get depressed about politics um, and worry about UK politicians. And then you, you look at America and think, well, you know, they're even more stressed about their politicians. <laughs> and, yeah, there um, is a there is a grass is always greener feeling, isn't yes. there? Yes. Just to uh, to stay on the UK for a moment and the, the takeover side that you mentioned. Mm. Uh, mm. Now that's been a big theme of the markets. That said, yes. you know, interest rates have risen. Mm. Times are a bit tougher for PE. You mentioned companies, you know, looking uh, mm. for cash now. Do you, do you think that rate of takeovers we've seen in the past couple of years will continue? Or do you think that well, the rising rates have made it harder? Interestingly, it's the first six months period when we've had no takeovers in the U- UK at all. Mm. But it's a topical question today is that MS, uh, the software business, was bid for last year and then referred to Monopoly's commission. Yes, and they've announced today that that's okay. But one of the really interesting things about that is the takeover has been there; the buyer hasn't gone away. And just because the mergers authority have said it's okay, the share price is up twenty five percent today, and that shows the gap between the market value and the takeover value, because it must have been still partly uh, considered the the takeover will go through. And that's something that's really at odds with the states. Is we've had lots of U.S. takeovers, but often the premiums ten percent, or in fact, this week, uh, Avid that does um, software for the media sector, um, audiovisual. The takeover there has been announced at a slightly lower price than it reached not very long ago. And often the takeover premium is is quite modest in comparison. So it tells you that the American market is valuing things much closer to a takeover value, whereas UK, the takeovers, it's the competitive tension between one acquiring company and another that sets the price. And the the public markets tend to be much, much lower. But it's one of the challenges of the UK small cap sector is that when there are more sellers than buyers because money is leaving the market. Uh, if you want to sell stock, you know, you can have to take a discount uh, to realise it in an unwilling market. But then the takeover comes out with a 50 to 100% premium. So a disproportionate part of the return has often come 
on takeover. I, I don't think takeovers are wholly negative because often when new markets, technology opens up new markets and you often have lots of small players in a new market and gradually there's consolidation as the winner takes over and the people who aren't quite winners need to get consolidated. The disappointing thing about the UK market is there hasn't been the funding for people to become the consolidators. The UK companies have always been consolidated. And it's interesting. I don't know. I'm sad that the UK semiconductor sector is, in the public markets has disappeared. And we've had some strong companies there in the, the life of Herald. Arm is obviously the most famous one, but there's been Imagination, there's been Wilson, um, there's been CSR. And Wolfson was bought by an American company called Cyrus Logic. And by all accounts, the Wolfson contribution is still really important, but it's now a US listed company. And Arm is clearly going to be a US listed company again, but sadly there isn't a semiconductor analyst. The sector left in London, so it's not really rational to float in London. But it's sad when, if you think how important both Arm and Imagination and Wolfson were, to the development of the iPhone with ARM providing mm. the, the brains, the processor, imagination provided the, the graphics for the screen, Wilson provided the audio, CSR provided the Bluetooth. A lot of the brains of the, the iPhone came out of the UK, but the sector isn't left. Um, and it, it makes me sad that um, the UK capital markets you know, valued things lower. So it, it, there's a positive and negative to that. The positive is you can buy things more cheaply in the UK. Um, I, I guess yeah. the negative is more as a taxpayer. <laughs> it upsets me that we, yes. we let the profits go elsewhere. Are you, uh, when you add to the UK, as you say, are you finding, in your view, are there enough companies to look at? You know, notwithstanding what you've just said about certain sectors withering away, do you still find, you know, a wide enough range of opportunities? It, the UK is entrepreneurial. Mm. There are creative people and there are clever people. Um, I think there are a shortage of co-investors more than there are a shortage of companies. And uh, companies have the temptation that private equity and venture capital will will fund them. And there's been a bit of a boom in that area. Uh, I'm a, a passionate sort of believer in the fact that companies should have permanent capital and ideally shareholders have perfect liquidity and the stock exchange is the nearest way of getting that. <laughs> uh, private equity is always temporary capital and liquidity from time to time. <laughs> so it's an imperfect structure. Um, so you know, the stock exchange is a natural listed companies is a good uh, natural thing that irritation is that private equity benefits from the fact they can fund the business with debt and take out profits without paying corporation tax and they can give management incentives more tax efficiently by giving them shares cheaply in a top co at the time of takeover or but there's no doubt that um in the long run i think things will revert to what's more natural and i think PE rather than venture capital, eh? that's often where there's been leveraged buyouts. They were clever at exploiting low interest rates and putting far more debt into companies than the public markets would, would tolerate uh, or be able to do. Um, and it's a big headwind for them that interest rates have now normalised uh, and it should make public markets more competitive versus, versus private equ equity. And the other thing is in a depressed economy, equity is a much better way of funding a business than debt for obvious reasons. So, you know, if companies funded with debt, interest rates go up, profits go down, <laughs> and even worse, you can have instability. Um, so it's much better for an economy to have companies funded with, with equity than debt. Let's uh, shift gears slightly and, and turn in part to the US, because the big technology story of the year has been AI and yes. its applications and its potential applications. 
uh, clearly that's been a big boost to mega cap US tech in particular, as well as yeah. some of the stocks uh, that you hold, you know, super microcomputer uh, being a, an obvious one there. But I wondered how much of your portfolio do you deem to be exposed to the theme and what will be the catalyst for those attributes to be recognized by the market if they haven't been already? Well, there's two um, sides of the coin. One is the supply chain um, to enable AI. And NVIDIA has obviously been the star of the big cap stocks this year because they have the um, the most processing power from the, the origins as graphic processing company. Mm. Um, but they have to go into computers and they have to go into data centers. Uh, so there is, we have benefited from some of the supply chain and Supermicro is one we've had that has made a disproportionate profit for us this year. The US listed company, uh, which makes, as it says, supercomputers uh, using chips, not just from NVIDIA, but also um, Intel and AMD. But for these high performance um, computing, a bog standard PC isn't, isn't enough. And they build custom computers that go into the data centers. Uh, and they have grown very strongly on the back of that, that demand. Um, but then you can go further down the chain. And another of our companies uh, makes high performance cables with the technology on the end of it to enable faster traffic in data centers. Um, Another company is a switch company because there's demand for faster switching speeds in the in the data center. So there's a whole supply chain that uh, often uh, are smaller companies that that benefit um, from that upgrade in demand. And then the other side of the coin is which are the applications that are going to benefit from the use of AI. And this is still a bit gray, and I suspect it will be a bit like the internet in 2000 the market mm. graphs the internet was significant but discounted um too many years growth and 20 odd years on i think probably the internet has been more transformational than the greatest optimists of 2000 and i suspect in 20 years time we'll look back at ai and realize how very significant it was in the short term it's harder to discern who's actually going to to make money out of it but there are two sides to it some people are thinking it will enable them to be more efficient in writing software so there are some software companies that have said that they think that it will reduce their development cost because some recurring recurring chores in the development can be can be automated another dimension which is obviously ripe for improvement is I'm sure we've all been exasperated by hanging on to utilities, listening to one for this and two for that and three for the other, and they haven't given you the right question. <laughs> and it's Indeed. obvious that AI can have a, a, a feedback loop to work out what are people's issues and how can we address them. But it's really interesting that a byproduct of that is traditional call centers, share prices have been trashed because they think call centers are going to be replaced by AI and sort of the more interesting dynamic is the the better call centers will use a AI more efficiently than the weaker ones uh, but you can see it's a more of an iterative pro process um, to get there obviously you've got Microsoft and Google producing AI engines and people are going to pay to use them so they'll be beneficiaries of the fact they've got a, a new revenue stream and i suspect um the the roadmap for microsoft is that office 365 you know started off with a, a word document and a spreadsheet and a powerpoint and then we've now seen it increase to incorporate teams and shared folders on a server you can just see that the next sort of app built on will be some sort of chat paid for um, AI tool, um, and that there will be a raft of things that haven't yet been been thought about. Mm. It's a bit like, I don't know, 
if you look at when our houses were first linked up with electricity cables, uh, there was an electric light on the end and maybe a, an electric fire. But I don't think people conceived that in due course, people would have personal computers and microwave ovens and all the other electrical devices we now have. And when the internet started, it was emails and <laughs> you know minimal amount. And now you can see how much that's evolved. And I'm sure there will be some big, big markets that do emerge. Uh, but it will take time where people are applying AI. But I suppose the obvious ones that we will move to having driverless vehicles, but that's not going to happen for a decade, I don't think, because of safety and so on. But think of the economic transformation. If you can have deliveries by robots and we can go on holiday to the north of Scotland yeah. overnight asleep in the car. <laughs> Luxury indeed. On the uh, supply chain side of things, I, uh, I'm curious, you know, clearly NVIDIA, as you say, has been the big winner, but, you know, some of the, the other aspects of it, be it the, you know, the switches, the cables, are these typically US companies still? Is this something where, you know, it seems like this hypothetically could be something where a UK company could be doing something under the radar, as it were, uh, and, have the, and have those been recognised share price wise? Bolex is an obvious one that supplies cables to a company called Mellanox, which we used to own, which was taken over by NVIDIA, and they do high-speed things. So there are there are beneficiaries. It's a small part of their business, but a fast-growing small part of their business. Well, looking at the UK market uh, in general, then the, the tech market, you know, we we've spoken about you know, the entrepreneurial spirit in the UK and, and you know the good companies that are still out there. But mm -hmm. when you when you look at UK tech, can you draw any you know broad generalizations about sometimes the things that they aren't so good at or the things that make you want to avoid or if not avoid a company then at least think oh that's kind of a common failing I see among you know companies in this space um I guess one of the key things is people have got to have enough money and there's a danger with in the UK is that they're very good at innovative products and very bad at realizing that you have to spend three times as much on selling the products as you do on developing it. Mm. And that's where the, the UK has been bad at the follow on funding um, to help people commercialize a product and why so much UK innovation has been marketed more effectively by US US capital. The, the thing it, why we've shrunk our loss making element of the portfolio is not because we haven't had investment opportunities but because we're worried about the lack of co-investors and there are times when we've been the only investor prepared to provide follow-on funding and we don't want to have too many ships out at sea <laughs> um, where and we do by exception go above 10 percent of companies uh, we generally kept like to have a diversified portfolio and keep below 10 percent because of liquidity etc and it's the easiest game in the book to perform in a small cap world if you buy more and more of the same thing. Um, but equally, um, when a company needs money, um, prices can get trashed if people have to raise money. And that is to me the most exciting opportunity we see over the next year is where there's a shortage of capital if you've got some money. Um, but you've got to be careful that you don't go for something that needs more capital than our pockets can provide. I say exciting because you know they're, they're, when people need money, there's not much competition and oh, well, not much competition from other investors to put money in. In a way, a couple of years ago, there was a bit of a bubble. I was going to sort of say, um, following on from that, you know, the market has changed slightly. Do you find this a more uh, maybe a more interesting or maybe a more enjoyable, dare I say, market, even with rates where they are, because we spent a long time in one yes. paradigm and yes. now things are all up in the air again. Yes, I do tell my younger colleagues when, we, when we, we're, we're down a bit. I think over the two-year period uh, to the end of last year, uh, the average P of the portfolio fell from 30.7 times to 17.8 times. And I said, it's really exciting that we've derated to that degree and the assets have only gone down 10%. And 
And I say, you can't expect to have a good time to buy and sell at the same time. Mm. And you've got to go through the bad patches to get the good times to buy. And 0203 was an absolutely wonderful buying time because lots of companies had been seeded in the internet bubble of 2000. And a couple of years later, people had fled from the sector, but some people that had been seeded hadn't got enough money to get through. And that provided wonderful buying opportunities. We had a second wonderful buying opportunity in 089. Well, I think the P went down to 10 then. So an even bigger compression. Um, but again, there'd been a bit of an AIM bubble. And there were lots of AIM stocks that came to market in 2005 to 2007. So that provided a wonderful buying opportunity. This time around, the bubble hasn't been in the stock market. The bubble has been in venture. And I think lots of companies have been seeded that will need follow on funding. I would be surprised if we don't get get opportunities. And actually, in the States, um, uh, the pool of companies between 100 million market cap and 3 billion in our target sectors are about 600 companies. But a third of them came to market in the sort of tech boom of 2021. Um, and we didn't invest in any of those IPOs. We didn't invest in any of the SPACs. It was obviously a speculative period. But it's now a really interesting swimming pool because I think on average, the IPOs haven't got the most up-to-date figure. But when we did run it, it they were down 40%. And some of the SPACs are down 90%. Some of them are uninvestable, but some of them will be interesting. Mm. There's been a bit of a spate of um, IPOs in Japan as well. And that's an area we're more interested in now than we than we have been. Um, valuations aren't as stretched as they are in America. Does all this mean that your you know turnover rates, you know, with the the you know potential buying opportunities and also in some cases the, the need to sell positions, does that mean no. they're higher than they have been? Do you find yourself more active this year? No, because the liquidity is so poor. Mm. But as I say, it's the first time for years that we've actually put net money into the UK. Well, not a huge amount because we're thinking we don't want to spend it too quickly. Mm. But equally, I say we've taken a lot of money out of the UK. We've also taken a lot of money out of the US, partly because there have been takeovers as there have been in the UK from PE, partly because valuations, we have sold on valuation grounds there in a way that we've rarely sold stocks in the UK on valuation grounds alone. We've taken 131 million out of North America over a period of time when we've taken 210 million out of the UK, uh, net invested in, in Asia, a uh, little bit in Europe. But one of the other um, dynamics that I'm still trying to work out quite what it means, there's a growing proportion of the market that's uh, index trackers. Mm -hmm. and it's even bigger in the US than it is here. You know, people have gone for these low-cost trackers. Uh, the flaw of tracking, uh, whether it's ETFs or index funds, is they don't provide primary capital, which should be the, the basic reason for a, a market to exist. And it does mean that there are probably more pricing inefficiencies because so much of the market is now dumb and a, a shortage of a reduced skill set of people to work out where to apply primary capital. And I really hope, I think there is a place for index funds, but I really hope it doesn't squeeze active management too much because that's the important skill set to work out where to allocate money. And I'm really proud of the fact that We've invested over 600 million in primary capital, although we've only raised 95 million of outside capital and um, and made 22 times on the NAV for, for our shareholders. An increasing proportion of the market is just not providing primary capital anymore. Mm. But, no, I think that's a good point. And, and as you say, we hope that that does uh, continue or, you know, that ability to provide that capital does continue because it is very important. Mm. But I think there's now political awareness that that's the case. 
and there's a bit of a disconnect between the regulator who's trying to reduce costs for people and the treasury who actually wants a, a growing economy <laughs> and it's it's yes. always the problem it would be very easy to eliminate car accidents if you reduce the speed limit to naught <laughs> the sort of same function that if you eliminate costs of managing money you might uh, not end up with the out outcome you you intend <laughs> indeed yeah. We're, we're running short of time, but maybe just to uh, to conclude, uh, sort of wrapping everything up. I feel like you know there's an obvious answer to this for any investor and any tech investor, certainly. But but you know, putting together all the the you know things we've discussed and looking ahead over the next you know six, twelve, eighteen months longer, you know, mm -hmm. would you describe yourself as optimistic for the portfolio for investment opportunities, etc.? Well, there's um, another important aspect is that I am quite cautious about the world economy because mm. fiscal deficits are too high everywhere and not just the UK, but in other countries. In fact, we're slightly further down the track of raising taxes and, and trying to address it. Um, but that has to squeeze the world economy, um, which is negative. Uh, for equities, particularly when you've got at least a, a certain return, even if it's negative in real terms after inflation um, from bonds. Um, but it does put a greater premium on companies than actually grow in an environment where the economists are sluggish. And because technology opens up new markets, there's a much greater chance of getting growth. So historically, if you look back, it's it's periods of sluggish economy where growth companies have outperformed the most. And in that sense, I think there are significant relative, relative attractions to, to the tech sector. And whatever the economy, there are some companies that are, are growing, albeit sometimes at other people's expense. Um, but that's where active management should you know has the opportunity to pay off indeed well as i say we have reached the end of time but mm -hmm. thank you so much katie for speaking to us it's been a great conversation and i'm sure our listeners will have enjoyed it as well that brings us to the end of this investors chronicle interviews podcast but do join us again next time thank you and goodbye